All right. So uh, this is a re-recording. Um, so the uh, microphone was accidentally muted when we did this one in class. I know that a lot of you guys use this for studying purposes. So trying to make another version for you guys, so that you have something to work with. Hopefully I can hit the same points that I hit in class. Um, and regardless, most of this should be really good for the test anyway. So um, this is the learning and memory part two. So this one's gonna dive a lot more into uh, kind of brain structures themselves and uh, some of the mechanisms behind a lot of this stuff, anatomically speaking. All right, cool. So what we're gonna go through as we kind of traverse through this lecture is uh, starting kind of at the microscopic level. So we're gonna zoom way in. We're gonna look at some cellular mechanisms that uh, may be kind of at play on the macro scale. Uh, and then we're going to kind of explore, we're going to zoom out a bit and explore the medial temporal lobe, those different regions that we were just discussing, perirhinal cortex, and perihippocampal cortex, uh, and then the gateway, interrhinal and the hippocampus. Um, and we're going to look at, after we kind of understand how these structures work, we're going to see how uh, those structures can kind of come to false conclusions and how we can kind of uh, make up false memories. And then at the end, we'll kind of look at memory consolidation and some theories about how we're uh, storing things in like this long-term storage kind of a way and how that might be happening during sleep, um, how we're kind of replaying information. So that's kind of the, the outline of what we're going to go through. So cellular learning, kind of amazing that uh, when you really zoom in as far as you can, it's just this vast, amazing world of these these living things that are sharing information with one another and they're able to somehow tag important information so that it can be brought back online really easy in the future. Uh, and that's kind of what we're going to dive into now. So we have Hebbian learning. So, uh, so Donald Hebb was a guy back in the, the 40s and 50s was really big in uh, psychology. He wasn't an actual um, neuroanatomist. He didn't uh, like take part in actually studying these neurons and everything. He was kind of a, an armchair philosopher in a way. Um, and he noticed what was coming out from these people that do study cells uh, was that he started to, to figure out that there might be this mechanism that was allowing things at the cellular level to create what we experience at kind of this agent level of experiencing things and remembering things. Um, and a lot of it came from uh, work from um, Hertz, uh, a guy that did a bunch of uh, electrophysiological work um, that noticed that there was elect electrical activity in the brain, uh, regardless of whether or not that person was doing something. And so it used to be believed that the, uh, the electricity itself was linked to some stimulus that was like Pavlovian, that we have to show them something and then the brain turns on. Um, but we showed that he showed that there was like this activity that was always there. And so Hebb kind of uh, had this idea that that activity that's just happening all of the time is kind of strengthening these connections that are important for us to be able to remember things. And so it was this idea that if, if an axon of one cell was near um, another cell and was able to kind of persistently fire it, uh, turn it on, then some type of process was happening that was allowing these things to grow together um, and to become more efficient. And so you have this kind of diagram over here where you have this really weak um, firing rate from this presynaptic cell. So it's trying to fire this postsynaptic cell. And this really weak firing isn't enough to get this thing going. And because of that, nothing is happening. This thing isn't getting potentiated. It's not getting any stronger. But if you have this really rapid firing and you have this cell lighting this one up all the time, uh, then something happens to the synapse. It grows, it gets stronger. Things are happening here that after this persistent activity, if you now deliver that same weak signal that you did up here at the top, now that weak signal is enough to get this thing to go. Uh, so something has made it more efficient. Something has made it so that this, this uh, circuit is more efficient and can bring things online a lot easier than before. Um, and it wasn't until like 20 years after Heb had pre predicted that this was the method that was being used uh, that Bliss and Lomo actually discovered this. Um, they were doing recordings in the hippocampus of rats um, and they were stimulating the, the perforant pathway, which kind of uh, is one of the pathways that comes into the hippocampus and then goes through all of these different sub, sub regions and things like that. Um, and they kind of came to this conclusion over here that if they were persistently activating this, uh, this pathway, uh, that it would 
it would result in what they called long-term potentiation, which was this increase in firing in the postsynaptic cells, the ones after the one that was firing, um, which increased the magnitude of EPSPs in the future. And so this was this idea that um, if you, just like we saw on this last slide, so I'll go back for a second. So on this slide, so um, they stimulated it like this with a really weak stimulation. They recorded what this postsynaptic cell was doing and it wasn't doing much. And then they stimulated the heck out of it here, just tons and tons of firing. Um, and then later they were able to deliver a really weak signal to this cell and still get it to fire. And that's kind of what this idea is, that the magnitude of the EPSPs increased after this, like, this hardcore stimulation. And so that later, the same type of weak, weak stimulation uh, produced larger effects in the postsynaptic cells. This was this idea that cells that fire together, wire together. Um, but what they found was that it was very timing dependent, that um, if the pulses were presented slowly and kind of far apart, um, that the opposite effect would happen and that you'd actually get this long-term depression and that the same stimulus would actually give you a weaker response. Um, and so this was this idea that cells that fail to sync kind of lose their link. So uh, long-term potentiation, you're strengthening the synapse so that weak signals can kind of create big effects in the future. And then the opposite of that, if you're not really having these cells fire together a lot, then uh, they actually, the synapse actually gets weaker. And so Bliss and Lomo kind of developed this set of rules around how these uh, synapses are being potentiated, how they're growing. And the first rule here is cooperativity. And so kind of break down this graph over here and how this works. So these lines on top of the this, this presynaptic cell right here indicate that this one is firing because there's no cells on the, I mean, no lines on the strong one. It means the strong one is not firing. And so this is this idea that if you have this weak stimulus, and this is something we were just hinting at in the last slides, if you have this weak stimulus and it's not enough to really drive this postsynaptic to start firing, to depolarize, um, that this weak stimulant, this weak synapse will not be potentiated. And so this is the activity of the postsynaptic cell before and this activity afterwards. So this weak signal didn't change the way that this cell fires. And so it's this idea that you need these to kind of be working together. You need a lot of activation happening for this to, to really get going. Um, and that's where associativity comes into play, right? And so now we have the strong one is firing at the same time as the weak one. And associativity is saying that even though the strong synapse is really what's driving a lot of the activity of this postsynaptic cell, if the weak one is firing at the exact same time, then the weak cell is potentiated as well. And so now this, this same weak signal before that did nothing now will produce um, some effects in that postsynaptic cell. And so it kind of got lumped in with this strong activity. And third point is specificity. So if we have that strong synapse that's really driving this postsynaptic cell to fire, if it's firing on its own and this weak synapse is not firing at the same time, the weak synapse is not potentiated. So the weak synapse has to be firing at the exact same time as the strong one um, for it to kind of be lumped in together and get potentiated. And so because this one wasn't firing at the same time, then you don't see this potentiation here. So that's the idea behind that. So NMDA is a receptor type uh, that has been linked to the ability of a cell to go through this potentiation process. And so um, our cell normally uses, uh, our neurons usually use these AMPA receptors to drive action potentials. So the AMPA receptors are the ones that will open up once a neurotransmitter hits them and they'll let sodium flood into the cell, which then causes the action potential to spike off. Um, but there's these other uh, NMDA receptors that if the cell is being fired enough, it's, if it's being potentiated a bunch, uh, these NMDA receptors will open up and they'll allow this kind of flood of calcium into the cell. And the calcium itself then causes this cascade of enzymatic effects happening in that synapse itself, really localized to that synapse itself, where um, you'll see that more receptors are recruited. That's kind of what this bottom right picture is showing is that once the calcium goes in, it sets off this cascade of changes within the synapse, which actually bring more of these AMPA receptors up to the surface. Um, there's also a growth process that happens. So the synapse actually gets closer to the presynaptic cell and some type of magic actually happens and causes this cell, the presynaptic one to start releasing more neurotransmitter. 
Um, and so all of this stuff is all kind of facilitated by this NMDA receptor. And they've, uh, they've done studies, I think I have that on, yeah, on this next slide, uh, that if you block these, that it actually causes long-term long potentiation to not happen. So something very specific to the fact that it's letting calcium in and calcium is setting um, all of these different enzymatic uh, effects into motion. And so this next one is this idea that uh, these molecular neuroscientists have figured out that when you, when you block these NMDA receptors, when you prevent the calcium from actually being able to flow through the channel into the cell, that none of those change processes actually happen. And so what they showed was that if a rat had already learned a skill, uh, then it wasn't affected. So it was something to acquiring new spatial knowledge. So they had these, these rats that were doing these, uh, these mazes. Um, and if the NMDA receptors were blocked, the rats were never able to learn the maze. But if they had learned the maze already, and then you blocked the NMDA receptors, they were still able to perform just as well. And so it's specific to the learning process itself. Once the learning has happened, once these synapses get potentiated, uh, the blocking isn't really doing anything because the growth process has already happened. The, the receptors have been recruited and the synapse has grown and all of these different things. And so it's this idea that it's that the NMDA receptors are really important for learning new strategies, but not really important for uh, if the strategy has already been learned. So I wish I had more time to, to go over these because these are really, really cool. There was a, a group of scientists that discovered these two cells. Uh, it was a different group of scientists that discovered each of these, but uh, they received the Nobel Prize in tandem for this. Uh, and so they had uh, electrodes hooked into the, the mouse's head while they were kind of traversing this environment. Um, and they were uh, plugged into the hippocampus. Uh, this was for play cells. They were plugged into the hippocampus and they noticed that this one cell that they were recording for from would only light up in this very particular area of space. And so this, this cell had kind of mapped out where in the environment it was kind of tuned to. And then there were other place cells that would fire from all of these other areas. And so these place cells had kind of made a map of the environment that the, that the, the mouse was in. And this was uh, this guy O'Keefe back in 1971. Um, and so this was kind of what I was just hinting at. There was this particular area of space that that one cell was just really, really focused on. Uh, and then this uh, group of scientists in the Moser lab uh, in 2005, so this was over 30 years later that the, the grid cells were discovered. Uh, so they were actually recording from the interrhinal cortex. So this is kind of that gateway into the hippocampus before you get there. And they found these cells that instead of firing for a very particular location in space, they would fire in these intervals that were regularly spaced apart, like really, really finely spaced. Um, and so this one cell created this like hexagonal grid all over the environment. And it was kind of this equilateral triangle um, separation between all of these dots here. And what they think is happening is that um, the place cells are in the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is getting information from the interrhinal cortex. And so what they think is happening is that the grid cells are allowing place cells to form, that the place cells are using the grid cells, because this is just one grid cell uh, depicted over here. So there's another grid cell that maps out a different grid of space, and then another one that maps out another one, and they're all kind of overlapped on each other. And so patterns of activity from the interrhinal cortex will say that like, um, this grid shows that all of these are kind of in this area. And so you have this one cell that now that is kind of specific for this one particular area. That's a, a little bit further than I need you guys to really know for the test. Um, what I want you to know is that place cells are for a very particular area of space and grid cells are kind of this, um, that one cell is at intervals, will light up in intervals and it kind of forms this hexagonal uh, or equilateral triangle grid over the entire environment. Cool, so that was uh, kind of the cellular side of things, uh, microscopic scale. And so if we zoom out and we see what's going on kind of at the, the, uh, the regional level, like what these different brain structures are actually contributing, uh, we see that medial temporal lobe is like the, the biggest candidate for a lot of this uh, long-term memory type uh, creation. And uh, we've seen that with lesion studies that we talked about in the first learning and memory lecture. Um, and then we've also seen that with uh, manipulations that we've done in animal models. Uh, 
And so uh, this was work that I actually did. Uh, this was like the first lab I ever worked in was a rat lab. Uh, and we did Morris water, Morris water maze type stuff. And so this, there's this pool and in the pool is this platform. That's what this dotted line is. And you see how the, the water kind of has this, this white tinge to it. They actually pour this like non-toxic paint into the water that makes it translucent. And so the rats can't see the platform that's under the water. Um, and so they're swimming around and swimming and swimming until they find it. And they don't want to be swimming. I mean, they're stuck in this pool. And so they want to find some safe ground and so that they don't drown after just swimming around forever. And so if you drop rats in this that are healthy rats, um, what they'll do is they'll use these cues that are outside of the pool. Um, this is kind of a, a silly example of just a normal room. Uh, usually when you see this uh, experiment done, there's actually like specific pictures hung up all around the pool. Um, and the rat is actually using those pictures to build a map of the environment. And so after a couple of trials, it will learn exactly where that, uh, where that platform is based on where it is in relation to all of the things that are around the tub. And so that's kind of what that was just getting at. So when you drop it in the first time, it kind of swims around randomly. But after the second or third trial, once it's kind of learned the environment, once it's mapped it all out, uh, then it's able to find it really, really fast. It swims right to the platform. But if you lesion the hippocampus, if you take the hippocampus out, these rats will swim randomly over and over and over again. doesn't matter how many times you do this. They're not going to learn where the platform is. They're not forming a map of the environment. And what we just showed in the cellular side of things is that the hippocampus is really important for building that map. Those place cells are trying to uh, align themselves to where they are in this specific environment. And it's using these contextual clues, these pictures around the tub uh, to form that map. And what we see though, is that if we, these rats that have the hippocampal lesion, if we drop them in at the same spot every single time, then we start to see that they're not swimming randomly anymore, that they're swimming straight to the platform. Uh, and this is something that you just want to kind of uh, separate out that uh, this is referring to procedural memory. Um, they've learned direction of swim. They've learned how to just use their muscles to get to the exact same spot every time. Um, and so this is more muscle memory, this procedural memory that doesn't rely on the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is responsible for kind of building this map. And so if we drop this rat in different places within the tub, um, then he has a map of this whole area based on those contextual clues. And he can kind of work it out and where he is at any given time and make it to the platform. Um, but if that hippocampus is, is lesioned, then they're going to swim randomly unless they're dropped in at the same spot every time. So they also do um, some studies where they look at how um, if they put a rat into a specific environment and they shock that rat, that rat will learn to fear that environment. And rats fear um, response is that they freeze uh, whenever something that they're afraid of is going to happen. They'll just stop moving. And what they found out was that if you lesion the hippocampus, and you put them back into that environment that they should be afraid of because they've been shocked in that environment, uh, these rats with the hippocampal lesion don't show any fear response. They don't show any freeze response. And so it's this idea that they haven't kind of uh, retained the, the fact that that, that map, um, that environment was uh, something to be feared, was something that had a, an aversive stimuli. Uh, the ones that had intact hippocampus remembered that it was the same environment that they got shocked in before. And so as soon as they were put in there, they'd freak out because they didn't want to get shocked. And so just another example that the, the hippocampus itself is responsible for kind of forming this map of specific environments. So kind of moving up the evolutionary chain and looking more at primates and seeing whether or not this stuff tracks up that evolutionary train because uh, we're a bit far removed from rats. And so if we can see similar type stuff in primates, uh, then we can kind of make the conclusion that there's kind of some preserved evolutionary uh, advantages to some of these systems. And so these lesions were done on the hippocampus alone or were done on the hippocampus and the regions around it. So removing parahippocampal cortex, pararhinal cortex, and intrarhinal cortex, all of those other medial temporal lobe structures. Um, and they did this non-match to sample task. And so uh, you'd have 
the food is underneath this um, this cross on the first trial. There's only one thing. It's really easy for the monkey to know that it's underneath that one. Uh, but then on the next one, the food is under whatever um, shape is different than what it was under before. And so if it was under the cross the first time, then it's going to be under this other one the second time. Um, and what they found was that animals had a lot worse impairments when all of the medial temporal lobe was removed, um, but showed that if it was just the hippocampus that was missing, they were still pretty good at the task. They weren't great, um, but it showed that there is there are things that these other structures outside of the hippocampus are kind of um, adding to the picture, that there is some function that those things can, um, can assume that is above and beyond what the hippocampus does. And so it was kind of giving us this, this hint that yes, the hippocampus is really important for laying down these, these long-term memories. Um, but some of that processing is happening before it even gets into the hippocampus. Uh, because when those areas are intact during this task, they're still able to kind of recognize some things. Um, and that's kind of what we'll, we'll get into now as we get into kind of the, the human side of things, kind of work all the way up. Now we're looking at uh, imaging type techniques to see if we're seeing these same types of activations and these same types of regions um, when we're putting people through these types of tasks. So something I just want to highlight before we get into these memory tasks um, is this distinction between uh, recognition and recall. Uh, these are experimental manipulations that are specifically used to isolate different types of memory. Um, and so with recollection, this is referring to um, conditions where we're asking subjects to just freely recall something. So that's kind of this one on the right over here. Like uh, it just showed you a bunch of people. Now tell me what this person's name is without giving you any other information, just asking you to freely recall it. No cues, nothing. Um, and this is something that's used to kind of uh, get at episodic type memory. Um, you have to kind of remember the context in which you learned this, this person's name and, and the contextual clues around it. You have to kind of put together this, this whole story to be able to freely recall something. Um, it requires a lot more uh, processing to be able to do this. We're not really, really good at uh, freely recalling something. If I showed you 10 items, you probably wouldn't be able to recall all 10 of them. Uh, whereas recognition, on the other hand, is... Uh, is tested by using this paradigm where we will show someone a bunch of different people. So like we show all these different people um, and then we show them a list of things that they have seen before and things that are new. And we ask them to say yes or no, if it's, if it's new or old, if they've seen it before, right? So this is getting at recognition. It's not asking them to just freely recall something. It's asking, have you seen this before? Is this something familiar to you? Um, and this is something that we have a lot more capacity for. Uh, there's been studies that have shown subjects 10,000 pictures, um, and they're able to correctly say that they'd seen like two thirds of them. So like 6,600 of them. Uh, so this is something that we're really, really good at. But something to note here is that the hippocampus is not highly active for this type of memory. Um, this is something that can be done without kind of the hippocampus being involved. And so what we're seeing here is that the hippocampus is kind of important for episodic type memory, for kind of creating this whole story that has all of this context included. Um, but if we're just saying yes or no, if we've seen something, this quick check, uh, then that can be done outside of the hippocampus. And that's kind of what we'll explore in these next couple of slides. And so this was a study that kind of looked at all of those different pieces within one study to try to see if we could um, tell whether or not there were separate systems that were involved in recollection versus uh, just recognition type stuff. And so what they did is they scanned all of these subjects while they presented these words on the screen. So that's up here, you have this paradigm. Um, and so the word itself, there's 360 of them and they were either printed in green or in red. And they represented either uh, living things or non-living things, so animate or inanimate objects. So you have nickel is an inanimate object, deer is a living thing, is an animate object. And depending on what color the word was, uh, they had the subjects doing something different in the scanner. So if the word was green, uh, they were saying whether or not uh, 
let me see, green was size judgments or uh, was animacy judgments. So if it was green, they were asked if it was alive or dead or alive or inanimate, animate or inanimate. Um, and if it was red, they were asked if it was big or small. Um, and these types of manipulations are, are mainly used to, to make sure that they're engaged in the task and that they're actually encoding the information. It allows them to kind of engage with the information a little bit. Uh, the researchers weren't necessarily care. They didn't necessarily care whether it was living or whether it was big or, or small. Um, and we'll kind of see that in a second. So outside of the scanner, so after they, they went through and they, they viewed all of these things, they were scanning them while they were encoding all of this information. Uh, they gave them a familiarity and a recollection test. So familiarity was kind of this recognition type thing. So they were just asking whether or not they had seen this word or not. Um, and then recollection uh, and familiarity was tested on a scale of one to six. So this is definitely a new uh, image or this is definitely an old image. And you can kind of see like, so in green were the ones that actually were old. And so when they said they were definitely old, they were usually right. Um, and then you kind of see in the middle, this is kind of when they're wishy-washy, I don't know. Um, and then over here, these ones that were definitely new, they were usually pretty right that it was a, a new word that they were viewing. There were a couple that they got wrong here. That's what you see in green. These ones in blue here were ones that they got wrong. Um, but this kind of shows that um, when we're really confident about it, we're usually pretty good at it. And then these ones in the middle are kind of 50-50, depending on how confident we are. Um, and then recollection was tested by asking what color a specific word had been written in. And so this is contextual. Uh, so context doesn't always have to refer to like location-based stuff. It's just uh, we've kind of learned in school about contextual clues when you're reading things. It's things that are kind of associated with that. And so you're kind of binding different elements together. And so we've encoded that nickel was in green and green is that contextual clue. And so that's what's being used to kind of test recollection. So they're shown a word and then they're asked what color that word was in. And what we see is that uh, when we were correctly recollecting, so when we were, this is free recall, when we were just saying what color the word was in, the hippocampus and the posterior perihippocampal cortex were really, really active. Um, and so this is kind of uh, what you'll see is really heavily involved in these contextual type details. This is the episodic memory component. Um, you also see some activation in the frontal lobe. Um, that's common because you're using the frontal lobe to kind of compare the activity to current goals and intentions and things like that. Uh, not something I really need you to focus on for this lecture in particular. Uh, what I want you to know is that for recollection, you have really heavy hippocampal activity. And then for recognition, uh, this was so just saying whether you've seen this word or not. Um, what they saw was that there were parts of the perirhinal cortex that were super active for recognition um, and that the increase in activity in this perirhinal cortex was tracking with how confident they were. So that's what we see in this graph right here. So if they indicated that they were super confident they had seen that word before, they had way higher activity in the perirhinal cortex versus when they said they weren't sure if they had seen it before. Um, and so this is really good evidence that the perirhinal cortex is heavily involved in just kind of recognition based stuff. And the idea is that you kind of have this ventral stream where you have information is being processed kind of in the what pathway. And once we've identified what an object is, then we're comparing it to things we've seen before. And that can happen without the hippocampus being active. And so the perirhinal cortex kind of sits right at the end of the ventral stream, right after we've identified what an object is. And it allows us to do some really quick comparisons. And that's why we have a lot more capacity for uh, recognition than for recall. And so I want you to know perirhinal cortex, really heavily involved in recognition. And the hippocampus is not necessary to be able to recognize something. Cool. So we have... Uh, this problem, uh, we've, we've talked about all these different types of things that are happening in the brain at any given moment, uh, all of this parallel processing that's happening. So we look at this kind of graph over here. We have these sensory receptors all over the body that are bringing information in. Uh, that kind of comes up to the thalamus and there's like different portions within the thalamus that are doing their own processing. The thalamus is sending things to the primary cortex. Um, and then the primary cortex is then sending information to these secondary areas. These are the unimodal association areas. Uh, so they're still just processing one sense, uh, but there's a bunch of different regions that are processing things in parallel. So if we're talking about vision, you could have one of these regions is processing motion and one of them is processing color. 
Um, and another one is processing features or like facial type stuff. So you have all these different things that are happening in parallel. And then all of those get sent to these multimodal association cortex uh, areas where you have like stuff from different senses is being put together. And you have a bunch of different regions that are doing different types of integration. So there's tons of parallel processing happening. Um, yet somehow all of this stuff is all kind of being combined and bound into this perceptual stream that we have, this coherent whole. Um, so this is what I was just kind of hinting at. And what we look at is that memories include all of these different things, all of the different output from all of these different processing regions. Um, and so there's something about memories that kind of uh, hint at this binding problem that this could be a really good candidate for where a lot of this information is kind of being brought together and put together. Um, and so we've seen that uh, the hippocampus is really heavily involved in kind of this contextual information. Um, but how is it getting all of the other stuff, um, all of the object recognition stuff and the location based stuff um, and goals and intentions and all of these things? And how is that all being kind of bound to um, the information, the contextual information that it contains? And so what we have here, and this is something I've, I've hinted at a lot, um, is we have the what pathway and we have the where pathway. So we have ventral stream and we have dorsal stream. And you have different information from all over the cortex is all coming into the medial temporal lobe. Uh, you have this ventral stream here. So features of objects. Um, so this is the identification type stuff uh, is all kind of coming through these unimodal sensory regions. Um, it's being processed really heavily. So it's at the point where it's already kind of been identified. And then that information is passing into the parorhinal cortex. And that's what we were just talking about. So because the parorhinal cortex is on this ventral stream, is on this what pathway, it's really good at doing recognition type stuff of features and objects. Um, the other side of things, the dorsal stream, the where pathway is locating things in space, right? And these things are all coming into the parahippocampal cortex. Uh, and this is situated more posterior in the medial temporal lobe. It's closer to the parietal lobe where a lot of this where pathway stuff is converging. And so you have what stuff is coming in through parorhinal, you have where stuff coming in through uh, par parahippocampal cortex. And then information from both of these ends up in the interrhinal cortex. Um, and so you have information about what an object is and where it is, both entering the interrhinal cortex, but you got to keep in mind the interrhinal cortex is kind of the, the gateway. And so this is still keeping all of this information segregated. And it's not until you get into the hippocampus that all of this stuff is bound together. So this is kind of this convergence of information. You have all of this different parallel processing happening, but all of it is kind of coming to a head and ending up in the hippocampus. And this is kind of a, a nice, um, kind of depiction of that with this really nice picture over here that kind of puts all that into perspective. And so again, parorhinal cortex is kind of who and what, and we see right here. So this is the ventral stream, kind of the, the lower version, the path that comes from occipital cortex back here where all your vision is happening. And all of that is being heavily processed to the point where by the time you get up here, you've identified what an object is. And once you've identified what an object is, that highly processed information is being passed into the parorhinal cortex. And so parorhinal cortex, because of where it's situated, is really good at recognition, at identifying whether we've seen something or not. Whereas information that's coming from the visual stream up here through the parietal lobe is kind of coming down this way and then passing into the parahippocampal cortex. And so this is all the location-based stuff, where things are at, right? The where and when type information. And all of that is coming into the parahippocampal cortex. Um, those things are both passing into the interrhinal cortex and then into the hippocampus. The interrhinal cortex isn't labeled well here, but that's kind of in between uh, the hippocampus and these two here. And then once it gets into the hippocampus, uh, the representations of the items are bound with the location-based stuff, the contextual stuff, and you end up with this full episodic contextual memory. So again, parorhinal cortex is sufficient to recognize something, but put the whole episode together, all of that needs to pass into the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is really, really important for laying down kind of long-term contextual memory.
uh, and relating things to one another. And that's kind of where this study uh, comes in. Is This is looking at uh, some lesion patients and their inability to make relations between uh, different objects and different locations in space and th things like that. So they were doing eye tracking for this study. So they're showing images of uh, these complex scenes to, to participants. And then they were looking at where their eyes were looking at this uh, different scene. And that's kind of what these dots here indicate. This is where they were fixating at any given point. Um, and it shows how they searched the scene, right? And so they would show this scene. Uh, so we had healthy controls and amnesics, uh, viewed complex images, like I was just saying. Um, and then the complex scenes would actually change. And so you'd have something like this, and then you'd have something like this, or you would start with a picture that had the woman in it, and then you would change it so that the woman wasn't there anymore. Um, and you see that these, these healthy controls uh, would spend a lot of time searching that area where the change happened. Uh, they related to the fact that this person kind of was in this location in space. They identified the person, they identified where she was in space, and they bound all that together. But the people that the amnesics, the people that had hippocampal or medial temporal lobe damage, did not search that area very heavily that had changed. And so it was this idea that they hadn't bound that information together. They hadn't bound the person or the object to the contextual kind of scene information. And so they weren't able to really see what had changed and they didn't search the area that had changed. So a really interesting demonstration of this that's kind of not using um, kind of brain methods per se, but really getting at some powerful stuff and showing that like these underlying memory processes kind of affect things higher up in the, in the spectrum of like where your eyes are moving. Really interesting study. So we look at uh, these lesion patients, right? Uh, we kind of talked a little bit about them in that last learning and me memory lecture, uh, but they put a lot of these uh, relational memory kind of tasks together to, to do these tests on people that had been through these, uh, these lesion surgeries. Um, and they relational memory tasks are kind of relate, referring to this fact that they had to kind of bind information together. They had to relate one thing to another thing. Um, and there was uh, ones that were specific for spatial, uh, ones that were kind of as associative, where it was like, uh, remember that the apple and the basket belong together. Um, and then also some sequential ones, kind of remember this pattern of information. Um, they also had an item recall test uh, and it didn't involve relationships. So this wasn't a relational type task. It was just kind of re freely recall what the item was. And what they saw was that people that had damage to just the hippocampus kind of failed at all of the relational ones, all of the things that required that they were kind of associating one thing with another thing and binding that information together. Um, but they didn't have uh, trouble on the single item recall task. So it was showing that like the, the recognition, the, the ability to kind of still identify that they had seen an object was still intact. So the parental cortex type stuff was still really, really working well. Um, but people that had more extensive medial uh, temporal lobe damage failed at all of the tasks. And so this is kind of hinting that the perirhinal cortex, uh, these other kind of outside of the hippocampus areas were damaged as well. And in that case, all of these memory tasks were really, really hard for those patients. And so this is just getting at it again, that the hippocampus is involved in kind of the binding of information. But if you don't have to bind any information together, then some of these other structures are able to, to kind of fulfill that role. So we show that all of this input comes in through the interrhinal cortex and into the hippocampus. But what we've also shown, and it's these, these older structures, these uh, especially like the hippocampal the medial temporal lobe system, um, a lot of work has been done to map out the circuitry and really see where the information is flowing in, where it's flowing out. And what we've found is that uh, the what and where output, so you have this ventral stream that's coming in, you have the dorsal stream that's coming in, it all comes into the hippocampus and gets bound together. And then you have this pathway that sends the information right back out the exact same direction. And so all of the where information goes back to the where areas, all of the what information goes back to the what areas. And what they think is happening here is you have this long-term potentiation happening. We talked about stuff that was happening on the cellular level where if you continue to fire uh, the connections between cells, that those cells will get stronger, right? And so that's what we're seeing here is that the hippocampus binds all this information together 
And then it reactivates all of those regions that were just active to make that memory in the first place. And the idea there is that it's strengthening those networks, those patterns of activity, so that in the future they can be turned on really easily. And it's this, this feedback system, right? And so you have all of the information coming in and then it all comes right back out to the same areas and lights those same areas back up. Cells that fire together, wire together. So we're creating stronger connections between those things that encoded that memory in the first place. And so we have some evidence from MRI. This is a really cool study. This is one that uh, I really, really like because it, it has a lot of really cool implications about what we can study. Um, so the conditions of the study, they brought people in for two different uh, behavioral sessions where they showed them a picture and they heard a sound that was paired with that picture. So they saw like a picture of a bell and heard a sound of a bell. Um, and it was so that they could show them a picture and have them think of the sound, right? Um, and each of these, either the picture or I, I kind of take that back. I'm sorry. Uh, the picture and the sound were each paired with a word, right? So you had a picture of a bell that was paired with the word bell, or you had the sound of a bell that was pictured with the word or that was paired with the word bell. Sorry if that was confusing. Um, the idea here is that uh, we want to be able to use the word bell to get them to think about the sound or get them to think about the picture. So the word itself is the cue that is getting them to either reactivate the sound or reactivate the picture. And the reason we're doing sounds and pictures is because we're trying to see if there's something different that's happening with visual information than is what, what is happening with auditory information. So then on the third day, so after they came in and memorized all of these pairs of pictures and words and these pairs of sounds and words, uh, they scanned them on the third day. And so first, the first thing they did was they did this functional scan while they saw all the pairs again, so or heard all the pairs again. So they would see the word and then they would see the picture and we recorded what was going on in the brain while they were actually experiencing those stimuli. Um, and then they were given a memory test where they were just shown the word. And that's kind of was what I was hinting at. The word was the cue. Um, and then they were asked to respond whether it had been an image or a sound and asking them to respond was getting them to, to kind of remember, was that a sound? Was it a picture trying to get them to reactivate and to retrieve that memory? And what they found was what we see over here, uh, this top image right here on the left is what was happening when they were viewing pictures. So you see a lot of occipital um, activation. So this is the, the visual cortex and the secondary visual areas were really heavily activated. And then down on the bottom left is what was heavily active uh, when they were listening to sounds. And so you see really heavy temporal lobe activity here. Um, and then what happened was uh, this one on the right on both of these was uh, when they were retrieving the memory and so this was what was happening when they were actually viewing it. And then what we're seeing is we're reactivating the same regions, kind of, not perfectly, but we're reactivating the same regions that were active during encoding. Um, and what we see here and what we think is happening here is that it's not going all the way back per se to like the, the sensory, the early primary regions, it's reactivating the highly processed information. And so it's going back and it's reactivating kind of the, the higher ends of that uh, hierarchy of processing. Um, but this is a really cool idea because if, if retrieval looks a lot like encoding does, then that allows us to do some really cool stuff. Because like they've done studies where they show someone a picture of an X, uh, the letter X, and then they have them imagine the letter X and they see really similar activity between the two. Um, and so this is something I want to take advantage of in my work. Um, because if we can use like video footage in the scanner, then we have some kind of an idea that uh, we're picking up on similar activity when they're reliving an experience than what was there when they were actually experiencing it. So this could be a cool avenue for future re research, but main takeaway here is that we are reactivating those same areas that were active during encoding. So this is when they were actually viewing things and remembering things or hearing things. Um, and then when they're retrieving it, so the sound or the picture are not there, but we're still reactivating those same regions. So this was something I did with you guys in class. Um, I had you guys remember this thing, and then I asked you if these different things were in that list. Uh, the idea was that needle was not in the list. Um, tricked a lot of you. <laughs> Um, and it's because there's a lot of contextual stuff that would hint that needle should be in this list. 
Um, and I used this example as something that showed how the brain kind of makes stuff up. It uses contextual clues to make its best guess about what should have been there. Um, and this has been kind of taken advantage of uh, by these uh, by these different researchers um, when we do when we look at like retrieval errors. Uh, so I'm actually going to pause this recording. I have to meet with my advisor, and I will try to finish it later. All right. All right, so I'm going to pick up where we just left off. So I had to take a quick break, but um, we were on retrieval errors. So the last example that I just showed you was kind of this idea that our brain kind of uses these contextual clues to uh, make sense of the world and to kind of make up stories when it can't figure out whether something was there or not. And these researchers, they, they kind of took advantage of this idea. And this was a really interesting experiment that they did. So they, they found these old pictures of people with their kids and they photoshopped these pictures and made it look like they had been riding in a hot air balloon. And they showed these pictures of the hot air balloon to these people when they were older. And they told them, this is a really cool picture of you and your dad in this hot air balloon. Uh, tell me about it. Tell me about that time that you rode a hot air balloon. And crazy 50% of them uh, told a story as if it had actually happened. Made up this whole thing. Uh, talked about different ways of wi ways that it felt, what it was like that day, all these different things. Um, and it kind of showed that when the brain was faced with this information that it couldn't make sense of, um, that it, it made up a story. It decided, oh, hey, you know what? That's really good evidence that this did happen. Uh, I'm going to save face and I'm going to tell you all about it. Uh, really, really interesting. And it was something I hinted at uh, kind of on the first day of class that uh, something you learn when you get into brain science and you start looking at the way that the brain deals with a lot of this stuff is that it really makes a bunch of stuff up. Um, if it can't make sense of something, if it can't really figure out where it came from, then it uses whatever kind of contextual clues it has to, to fill in the blanks um, and to really kind of make a whole story out of it. And this was a really, really good example. I mean, half of these people that had never been on a hot air balloon before uh, described this whole experience like they had. And they just kind of like, oh, well, you know, maybe I was young, so I don't remember it really well. Um, but researchers started to kind of pick into this a little bit um, and explore this effect because it was, it was pretty big. I mean, half the sample kind of making up these false memories. But when they really started to, to dig in and to, to ask them more about the story and about what happened, uh, they started to see that the stories, the memories that were real tended to have a lot more sensory details uh, versus the ones that were that were false, the ones that the, the researchers were getting them to believe were actually real. And so they were tending to provide a lot more detail about how it felt, what it smelt like, if it was hot, if it was cold, those kind of things, if the, the memory was in, was in fact a real one versus a false one. Um, and it, when they explored the literature and they looked at all of these different studies that have kind of explored this false memory effects and looked at like the brain data and things like that, um, they actually showed that there was greater activation um, in the medial temporal lobe and in the sensory regions. So this is that idea that like when we're retrieving something, we're actually reactivating those sensory regions that were active when we were encoding it. Um, and this idea that there's greater activation in these regions, both in the medial temporal lobe, which is actually kind of helping encode all of these memories, and in the sensory regions that were actually active when we were feeling things, um, it shows that if the memory is real, then we're able to kind of reactivate those, those old circuits. And we're seeing that those real memories involve not just telling sensory details, but actually experiencing those sensory details and reactivating those areas of the brain that are involved in those sensory details. And so what kind of came out of this was that they were arguing that our our memory systems aren't really flawlessly preserving everything that happened, uh, but we're able to kind of flexibly combine information from, from different places um, and use those, those different uh, 
uh, flexible representations of things to kind of create stories. Um, and that's where you see like the false memories coming from is that uh, we have experience with what it was like to spend time with our dad. We have experience with what it probably feels like to be on a hot air balloon and what hot air balloons look like and those kind of things. Uh, and our brain just kind of takes those, those details and puts them together into a story. And we as humans, the, the cortical capacity that we have uh, gives us the ability to really be flexible with a lot of these things. Um, and so this flexibility, this, this ability to kind of combine information uh, really helps us anticipate new things and solve current problems by kind of taking what we've already learned and kind of uh, integrating it together to try to figure out how it applies to what we're experiencing now. Um, and that kind of ties into this, uh, this memory integration work that's being done. Um, there's a researcher here on campus, so Dasha Zaitomova, it's who I did my master's degree with, uh, does a lot of work on this, this idea of memory integration and um, the brain regions that are involved in this. And so the, the basic idea behind here, and so this is kind of highlighting the frontal lobe is a big player in this. Um, we've kind of hinted at this a lot that uh, the frontal lobe gets input from everywhere. It's this really big um, multimodal kind of integration center where it's getting information from all the different senses, getting inf information from the memory systems, all these different things. And we think that it's kind of keeping things online because we talked about it in relation to like working memory and things like that. And so it's kind of bringing all of these things up and then it's allowing us to do these comparisons. Um, and so activating old representations and comparing with new ones. That was kind of the idea that I was hinting at. And so these, these paradigms that study this, they usually deal with associative memory. So remember that these two things belong together. So uh, the apple and the basket are a pair. Remember that those two things are connected. Then remember that these two things are connected. So this guitar and the basket are connected. And what you see here is that the apple and the guitar both have a connection to the same item. And so the apple and the guitar are kind of indirectly connected with one another. And so what we're seeing here is that the frontal lobe is allowing us to see what was similar between those two things and to make inferences about these kind of indirect connections between things because of the ability to kind of integrate all of this information. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals see kind of an idea. Um, that's kind of this idea. So if A is connected to B here and B, which is the basket, is connected to C, then we can kind of infer this indirect connection between the apple and the guitar. Um, and it's this idea that the frontal lobe is kind of keeping all of this information online so that we can kind of compare these different representations and what was going on with them. Uh, we bring up the apple and we kind of have this tied information to the apple and then we bring up the guitar and the guitar has this tied information and so now we have all three of these things kind of active at the same time um, and because all three are active then we can kind of look at the the indirect relationships between things um, there's actually some really cool studies that show that we can actually see the brain activity that represents this thing being brought online um, really really cool um, kind of beside the point um, what I really want you to take from this is that the frontal lobe is really heavily involved in this integrative process. And they've shown that there's kind of this theta oscillation uh, between MPFC and hippocampus. So like they'll, they'll kind of get on the same wavelength in this kind of theta band, uh, showing that they're kind of in sync with one another and that they're talking to one another. And that's kind of evidence that the MPFC is pulling things from memory to try to compare it to other things that, that are currently online in working memory. So uh, a lot of stuff, this was something that was uh, a slide that I kind of moved because it, it fit better afterwards. Um, but there's a lot of uh, debate in the field about what the frontal lobe is actually doing and like what it's representing. Um, and a lot of studies have shown that there's kind of this lateralization effect that uh, the frontal lobe is bringing these like objects back online or faces back mm -hmm. online. Um, but that different parts of the frontal lobe are actually holding different types of information online. So the left hemisphere was uh, more involved in linguistic type representations. So uh, reading the name of a word um, and keeping the name of that word kind of uh, in mind. Whereas the, the right was more involved in kind of these, uh, this object and spatial type stuff. Um, and you see... This is, I'm trying to see if this is backwards. Yeah, so this is usually with MRI, the left and right is backwards, but this is actually correct. Um, and so 
Here we see this linguistic representation. It's purely linguistic. You may be thinking of like a picture of a hammer and that may be why you're getting some uh, right frontal activity. Uh, but here you're kind of getting both, right? So you have this frog, you have like the shape of the frog, the object of the frog, uh, but you're probably saying in your mind the word frog and that might be pulling up this kind of linguistic representation of the frog. Um, whereas a face, someone that you've never seen before, there's no way to really name that person. And she's kind of purely an object. It's kind of kind of centered on the right side. Um, there's a lot of studies that have kind of dug into this and shown that there's, there's lateralization here. And that's really what I want you to take from here is that the frontal lobe itself, it's holding a bunch of information online, but what type of information is kind of reserved for either the left or the right half of the brain. And the left is really heavily involved in language type stuff. And the right is more involved with uh, just objects in general, things that aren't necessarily being named. That's why this says nameable objects is lighting up both halves. Cool. Uh, this is some other work that's being done here uh, with the memory researchers. And this is not something that I'm gonna necessarily test you guys on, um, but this gets into differences between um, how we're actually comparing new information to old information. And there's some different theories. Like one of the theories is this kind of exemplar theory where we see a dog and we're comparing that dog with every other dog that we've seen before, every example of a dog that we've seen before. And there's another kind of uh, portion of the, the research field that says, no, we're not comparing that dog to every single dog that we've seen, but rather we're comparing that dog to kind of the prototypical dog, this, this kind of average of all the dogs that we've seen that has all the features that are necessary for a dog. It has four legs, it has hair, it has a tail. There's a lot of different dogs that'll fit into that category, but it is kind of this prototypical um, average representation. I mean, this always like screamed like platonic forms at me. Um, I was really into kind of Socratic philosophy back in the day. Socrates had this idea that there was like these, the perfect representation of everything. Like there was a, a perfect tree and there was a perfect form of beauty and all of these kind of things. And what we're starting to see in the literature and what we're starting to see in the research is that there may not be perfect versions of those things out there, but our brain constructs these like representative models of those categories of information that we have kind of this average dog in our mind or this average spoon. You're not comparing the spoon to every spoon you've seen. You're comparing the spoon to kind of spoonness uh, sort of thing. And so this kind of uh, is what I was just getting at. So the exemplar, there is evidence showing that sometimes we use this strategy. Sometimes we are comparing something we're seeing to specific examples of other things from that category. But this is usually um, when we've seen those other examples really uh, close in time. So if we just saw a bunch of other spoons and then we see a new spoon, then we're comparing that spoon to those other ones that we just saw. But if you're just shown a spoon, or if you're just shown a dog and you're not shown any other examples before, then there's evidence that we're kind of bringing up this prototypical type representation of it, which is just kind of an average of all of the things from that category. Uh, the parietal cortex is another uh, big one outside of the medial temporal lobe that's been implicated in memory type um, stuff. And what we're seeing is that the parietal cortex is really heavily involved when there's successful retrieval. And we're not really seeing um, the parietal cortex involved in encoding. And so if you're doing these contrast type methods with MRI um, and you're trying to say like, okay, uh, show me what regions are active uh, when I'm encoding something, so when I'm seeing it for the first time and laying it down into memory versus baseline. And when you do that, you don't see parietal cortex activity. So it's this idea that the parietal cortex isn't really heavily involved in actually laying the memory down and encoding the memory. But instead, if we look at what's going on in the brain when they're retrieving information, so we're asking them to actually remember something that they saw before, all of a sudden now we get really heavy um, parietal, cort parietal cortex activation. And so it's this idea that it's really heavily involved in kind of searching um, the, the memories, the store of memories that we have. And it's been really implicated in, in attention. Um, and this could be kind of something, this kind of side role that it has that kind of relates to attention um, is that it's kind of trying to search the available memories for the important information that's similar to what we're dealing with right now, what's kind of our goal or intention right now and what memories would help kind of facilitate that goal. 
Uh, and it kind of, we think that the parietal cortex is really heavily involved in kind of that searching process. And so uh, not really active during encoding, but really heavily active during retrieval. Um, and this is uh, not something I'm, I'm going to test you on, but these were some of the theories out there. Um, I don't have a good sense yet of why these two theories are necessarily different from one another, because it feels like both of them can kind of be happening at the same time. Um, but one of the theories is kind of this working memory maintenance hypothesis. Um, and so it's this idea that the parietal lobe is really heavily involved in kind of manipulating information that's being held online. And so from that kind of context, the frontal lobe would be kind of holding this information online and sharing it with the parietal lobe. And then the parietal lobe is able to kind of manipulate and compare things. Um, the other one is kind of this multimodal integration where it's kind of uh, activated by tons of different types of information. Um, like I said, this is kind of an odd slide. This came from the book. There wasn't a lot of information in the book about these two theories um, and how they kind of compete with one another. Because I feel like if you're kind of doing maintenance on working memory, that that's also going to involve a lot of multimodal integration because you're uh, handling and, and maintaining a ton of different kinds of information. Um, and it's coming from all of these different regions like we're seeing over here in this picture. So uh, don't don't read too much into this slide and don't don't study it a lot. Uh, this is just kind of um, some avenues for future research if you guys want to dive into the parietal lobe more. Cool. And this slide kind of ties all of this stuff together that we've been talking about. So it's kind of making this distinction between anterior and posterior medial temporal lobe. Um, where we've seen things that are anterior or more to the front are more involved in like object recognition type stuff. And these are the, the brain regions that are kind of along that ventral uh, pathway, that what pathway. Uh, whereas the posterior ones, the ones that are kind of closer to the back over here, are more tied into this dorsal stream, this location-based stream. Um, and that's kind of more involved in contextual type stuff. And so this is kind of reiterating that. So the anterior temporal lobe is the one that's kind of along this ventral path. That's kind of the ones in red here. Um, and you have the perirhinal cortex right here is the one that's really involved in recognition. Um, and then it sends stuff into the hippocampus. And then you have the posterior medial, medial system is more involved in recollection type stuff. So this would be episodic memory, right? Our ability to um, add contextual detail to whatever it is that we're interested in at any given point. So anterior recognition, posterior is going to be more contextual recollection based stuff. So recognition, recollection is really what I want, to want you to take from that. And like I said, this ties everything that we just talked about together. And like the, the most important regions that we've been discussing, we have the, the perirhinal cortex up here at the end of the ventral stream. We have the parahippocampal cortex at the end of the dorsal stream. And then all of the information from both of those enters the interrhinal cortex and then into the hippocampus. Uh, and so this kind of just kind of brings all of that together. And so this was this idea that this interior uh, temporal system is is related to significance of items. We've identified an object and then we're comparing it to things in memory to figure out whether or not it's important or not. Um, whereas with the, the posterior one, um, this is more about kind of relating things to one another, um, adding those contextual details and kind of comparing things based on those contextual details. So last portion that we'll get into is consolidation. Uh, this idea of storing these these memories for long-term use. And it's kind of amazing. I mean, some of these memories can last a lifetime and are just sitting there waiting for some kind of trigger to wake them up, smelling grandma's cookies or something like that, uh, to really bring all those back to the surface. And kind of amazing that these, these circuits can kind of be kept online for years and years and years. And the laying down of that circuitry is kind of this consolidation process. And so this is something that we kind of talked about in the last lecture. Um, the, the term consolidation refers to the, the stabilization of memory, the ability for it to kind of be robust and strong. Um, and we've seen from like uh, ECT or electroconvulsive therapy and head trauma 
uh, that you usually end up losing a bit of memory right before the, the traumatic event, either the electroconvulsive therapy or the head trauma. Let's say you're in a car accident or something. Um, this right here, this six months seems a bit long in this picture that I have. Um, usually it's a couple of hours to maybe like a day that you're losing. Um, but there are cases where you do see kind of more extensive six month type periods here. Uh, but the idea here is that the information in this yellow box here has not been consolidated yet. It hasn't been fully stabilized and transferred to long-term memory stores. And so when you have that head trauma, you're losing everything that's with that's inside that consolidation period. Um, and that's kind of what this, this point is getting at. And so we know, like we've talked about from these lesion studies, the hippocampus is really, really important in that, that transfer uh, type process and, and laying down an episodic memory and then moving that episodic memory to the cortex for storage. Um, we don't know kind of how this is happening on kind of a slow hour by hour, day by day type thing. So the studies that we do are in real time uh, when we put something in the scanner. So it's hard to kind of see how these processes are unfolding over a day or over a month or a year or something like that. Um, but we have some stuff that we'll look at here in a minute that kind of hints at uh, methods that we think the brain is using to, to really strengthen and to stabilize these memories. So these two theories that I'll get into um, are kind of reiterating what we've talked about. The next one is a little bit complicated, not something I'm really going to test you on, but uh, this kind of highlights what we talked about already. So. Um, this is this idea that the hippocampus is really, really involved at the beginning at really tying all of this cortical activity to one another, creating this kind of circuit and saying like all of these different things are kind of bound together. So when I have this memory, I want to make sure that I'm reactivating all of these different cortical regions, these different sensory regions and highly processed regions and things like that. But after the consolidation happens, um, some kind of interaction between the medial temporal lobe and the cortex, somehow that representation is transferred completely to the cortex. And this is this idea that even people that that have their hippocampus removed um, can still have long-term memory from childhood. They can still remember things from years and years ago. But the hippocampus, without the hippocampus, they're not able to lay down new memories. And so this is I, this idea that... Um, as this kind of gets reactivated over and over and over again, that eventually it gets to the point that the memory itself is connected enough. It's kind of what these gray lines turning into red ones, that the memory itself can activate this whole circuit without the hippocampus helping to put all those different pieces together. And so multiple trace theory um, is kind of in competition to that one that we were just talking about. This is a little bit uh, newer of an idea, um, but uh, not, like I said, not something I'm really going to test you on. It's kind of a complicated idea, but it's this idea that uh, they don't think that um, episodic memory is possible at all without the hippocampus. So even though these people claim to remember all of these things from their childhood and everything, um, they believe that that's just personal knowledge, that it's semantic, that there's not really a lot of context and that those people aren't really activating, reactivating a lot of those like old sensory regions and things like that. They think that that requires the hippocampus to put all those pieces together. Um, and what they're saying is that every time we encounter something that's similar, um, so we see a dog and then we see another dog and there's some similarities between that and the old dog and our hippocampus starts to kind of make those connections along with help from like the frontal lobe and things like that. And then as we keep interacting and as we keep bringing that memory online, every time we bring the memory online, uh, we start to see that there's kind of this gist information that uh, is kind of pulled out over time. Um, and after we've kind of figured out what is kind of common between all of these different memory traces, uh, then it's kind of transferred to the cortex as semantic information, um, as kind of rote information that doesn't really have contextual details. So something that we don't really know when we learned it, but we can still verbalize it. And the more times a memory is retrieved, the more memory traces are created. That's kind of this idea that every time we retrieve this memory, uh, we're kind of laying down more and more similarities between all the different components of it. Um, and then near the end, it's just kind of, it exists as kind of this just knowledge. Um, it's not necessarily episodic. So this is kind of a, a complicated theory. Uh, like I said, not something I'm going to test you guys on, but for those that want to dive a little bit deeper um, and want to kind of explore 
where the theories of hippocampal function and consolidation are going. This is kind of the, the two main avenues right now, at least according to the textbook. So um, this is something that's really cool, really exciting, um, is the work that's being done with sleep and showing how much brain activity and how much consolidation activity is happening while we sleep and how important sleep is for learning things. Um, and a lot of this work came from kind of the, the rat literature after we discovered these place cells that we talked about at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, we started to notice that we had mapped out all of the place cells that had been active while this rat was traversing this environment that he was in. Um, and we saw that that pattern of activity, those different place cells were replaying while the rat was sleeping. So the electrode was left in the rat's head, the rat went to sleep, and those exact same place cells started to play. And it showed that it wasn't just that the play cells were kind of playing in the same spatial sequence, but they were playing in the same temporal sequence. And so the exact same sequence of cells that had lit up while that rat kind of walked around his environment lit up again and replayed again in the exact same sequence. Uh, really, really cool finding, really cool idea. Um, and this, this kind of tells us a lot about dreams and things like that, that um, it could be that we're, we're reactivating all these things that we've done and learned throughout the day. Um, and that our brain is just trying to kind of make sense of that information without any kind of sensory input. Um, and that's how we end up with like stories and things like that. And there could be more to it than that, but um, that's kind of what some of this earlier literature is kind of hinting at. Um, and this was a, uh, a video that I pulled up during class. Um, and what we see here is that this replay isn't just happening while the, the rats are sleeping, but it actually happens while they're awake as well. But when it happens while they're awake, it actually happens in reverse order and happens really fast in this kind of burst of activity. Um, and so it's this idea that there may be kind of this... Um, this learning process happening on the fly where we're integrating all this information where we're stopping for a minute, we're thinking about everything we just learned, going through all of it again, laying down and strengthening those connections and then moving on to the next thing. Um, and so this is this idea that I was just hinting at that it's kind of playing in this reverse temporal order when we're awake. And that's what this, um, this YouTube video gets into. So I'll play that for you real quick. And See if I can get the sound to work on here. No, no, that's okay. Uh, I wasn't able to get it to work in class either. Uh, but the idea here, and this is something really cool if you wanna kind of pull this video up on your own and listen to it, uh, really, really cool. So these different colors that are popping up are uh, different place cells. So each different color is a different cell that's representing a different uh, position in space. So this cell kind of likes this area of the, the maze, um, this cell likes this area of the maze, and then you'll notice here in a second that the rat will stop. And when it stops, you see this burst of activity right there, boom. And what's happening is that all of those different cells are kind of replaying. And then it's gonna happen here again in a second. And when you listen to the sound, you can actually hear this like really just, just burst of activity happen. So he's kind of working through, there's a big burst right there. And so it's he's kind of laying down what he just went through, this kind of memory that he just went through um, to try to kind of consolidate all of this kind of stuff on the fly. So really, really cool idea. And just seeing these different colors pop up is, is amazing that these cells are specific to these like particular areas in space. It's not perfect. Um, and I mean, the recording stuff is, is not perfect, but this is a really, really cool uh, study and a really cool video. I really encourage you guys to kind of watch this and to, to listen to it happening. Um, this kind of blew me away when I saw it the first time. So I'll get into the rest of the lecture here real quick. So uh, just a couple more studies to, to get into um, and people that are interested in whether we can learn while we're asleep. So this was a cool EEG study um, where they showed the subjects pictures that were kind of accompanied by a sound. So they'd see a picture of a cat and hear a meow or see like a tea kettle and they'd hear a whistle. Um, and the picture occurred in a particular location on the screen. And so they were trying to remember what that location was that the picture went up. And then the sound is kind of used as a cue later on. Um, 
So subjects were asked to indicate in a test when hearing the sound where the picture had been on the screen. So that's kind of what I was just getting at is that the, the sound itself is a cue. And so when they hear the sound then they're asked to say, okay, where was the cat on the screen, right? Where was the picture that was associated with that sound located? And they did this, they taught them all of these pairs. They had them go to sleep with an EEG net on and the EEG net allowed them to see kind of when they were entering into this like slow wave sleep period. And once they entered into that slow wave uh, sleep period, then they started to play these sounds to the people to try to reactivate the memories while they were sleeping. And when they retested these people after they woke up, the sounds that they had heard while they were sleeping were pairs that they were way better at than ones that they hadn't heard while they were sleeping. So they didn't hear all of the different sounds while they were sleeping. They just heard like half of them. Um, and the ones that they heard while they were sleeping, they were a lot better at saying where the item had been located. So this idea that we were kind of strengthening that memory uh, while they were asleep. And it may be that it was, it was better to do while they were asleep because there was already this kind of consolidation process happening. Uh, and this other one uh, was uh, out of Europe, this uh, Schreiner and Rash. Uh, they took these native German speakers and they showed them these German Dutch word pairs. Remember that these two words are associated with one another. Um, and uh, they had them, I think they were listening to them. I don't think they actually showed them to them. They like had them listen to these, these pairs of words. Uh, and one of the groups listened to the pairs while they were sleeping and the other group didn't. And they wore EEG while they were sleeping. This wasn't necessarily to figure out when they were in slow sleep, but this was to try to figure out kind of what brain signals were associated with this, this whole um, phenomenon that they were finding. Um, and they found, again, that groups that listened to the pairs while they were sleeping actually learned the pairs better. It's kind of what this bar right here is showing. So this bar in black were the groups that were actually listening to the word pairs while they were sleeping. So it's not a huge increase, but definitely significant. Um, and what they found from the EEG was that it was associated with this, this greater theta activity, um, their ability to recall these different words. Uh, and what we've, we've seen theta pop up a lot. We were just talking about it earlier when we were talking about memory integration and, and the frontal lobe communicating with the medial temporal lobe. And they think that these, these theta bands are associated with communication between uh, different regions of the brain. And that that could be kind of this way that these brain regions are kind of coordinating their activity and then strengthening those synapses. Because if you keep firing those synapses, if you kind of light up those connections over and over again, you see long-term potentiation, kind of linking back all the way to the beginning of the lecture. Um, and so it's like at a, at a macro scale, there's these consolidation processes happening where all of this different activity is, is kind of being distributed and replayed throughout the brain. But at the cellular level, when you really zoom in, uh, what's happening is that each of the synapses within that network uh, is being strengthened and is being put to the, the point where that memory can be retrieved really easily in the future. So uh, this is, I think, our, our last slide. Um, and this was related to some work that I also did in my, um, in my master's work. Uh, this is looking at the impact that stress has on learning. And we'll get more into this when we talk about emotion. Um, but the, the literature has shown us that kind of low amounts of stress can actually improve performance. And so if you're studying for a test, it might be good to kind of care about it to be under kind of low amounts of stress. But if you're putting yourself under too much stress, if it's something that is like a do or die situation, something that is traumatic, um, and this kind of ties into uh, situations with like witnesses of traumatic events and things like that, where you have these, this fight or flight response is really kicked into high gear. Um, when that fight or flight response kicks up, uh, it pumps out a bunch of cortisol and the hippocampus actually has a bunch of these, these glucocorticoid receptors, which is saying that it, uh, it can be modulated by cortisol. That's what these glucocorticoid receptors are. Um, and when the hippocampus is inundated, when it's covered with cortisol, it actually starts to impair the hippocampus's ability to lay down memories. And so when you're really, really stressed, your memory is actually being vastly impaired. And so that's something to really keep in mind when you're studying. You don't want to put yourself into this really high stress state because uh, it's really damaging your ability to remember that information and to be successful. Um, that's kind of what this was getting at. And so they've actually done this with... Uh, 
Uh, instead of having to rely on you getting into a fight or flight situation, they've just injected people with 10 milligrams, which is actually a pretty low dose of hydrocortisone. And it detrimentally affects their, their verbal episodic memory, their ability to lay down these, these episodic memories. Um, and we've seen in elderly people that report having high levels of stress throughout their whole life that the hippocampus is actually damaged, that there's a 14% reduction in the overall volume of the hippocampus. Um, and this is something, like I said, I kind of worked on this throughout my master's degree. It's, uh, it ties a lot into like PTSD symptoms and things like that, where uh, they believe that in high trauma situations, when you're just just covered with cortisol because you're so stressed out and you're in this fight or flight situation that the hippocampus actually isn't laying down any meaningful episodic memories. So everything that you're remembering and you are remembering things, you're, you're laying down memories, you're laying down uh, emotional memories and you're laying down memories about the objects that you're seeing and all those kind of things, but none of it is being bound to the context. None of it is being kind of contextualized by the hippocampus. And so they think that with PTSD, that because these memories don't have any contextual details attached to them, they're really hard to retrieve consciously. It's hard to just pull them back up. And because of that, these people with PTSD have a really hard time facing those things because if they can't bring them back up to mind, if they can't retrieve them, then it's really hard for them to face them. Um, and so those types of memories, those emotional memories, because there's no contextual information, they're triggered by salient stimuli. So the, the fan spinning um, brings up automatically this memory of like helicopter blades or something like that. Um, so these triggers that aren't consciously controlled. So interesting kind of field of research. I really enjoyed getting into it, um, but that's kind of where we'll stop today. So I hope you enjoy the re-recording. Hope it's helpful for studying purposes. Uh, good luck on the test.